Hi everyone. Uh, this is kind of random. It is Monday night. It's the Monday night of Memorial Day. I hope you all had a good weekend. I have actually not been able to stop thinking about the mass shooting, the school shooting in Texas. Hi everyone. And um, I don't know how you have felt about it, but I wanted to invite someone who is really one of the smartest people I know when it comes to everything involving gun violence in America and efforts that have been made to reduce gun violence. Her name is Robin Thomas, and um, she's gonna be joining us in just a second. She lives in San Francisco. She works very closely with Gabby Giffords and her organization. Um, so let me just see. We were saying that she hasn't done this for a while, so I have to just look for her. I'm going to request her now. Anyway, if you all have any questions about... Here we go. Here she is. Um, questions about sort of the state of gun violence in America and what has been going on and why can't they reinstate the assault weapons ban? The fact that so many mass shootings, uh, the perpetrator has used an A-15 semi-automatic rifle. I'm not that knowledgeable about guns. Sorry, that's my daughter's cat. Uh, but Robin is, and about gun legislation, if you're as frustrated as I am about the fact that this keeps happening, time and time again. Robin is hopefully going to be here to give us some reasons to feel, I don't know, give us some advice on what we can do as citizens. Hi, Robin. Hey, Katie. I was just telling everyone who was joining us that you were one of the smartest people I know and so well-spoken about this issue. Why don't you briefly tell everyone sort of your background um, because so they, they can have confidence in knowing that this is accurate and reliable information. Sure, so um, I'm an attorney by training and have been doing work in the gun violence prevention space for almost two decades, running an organization which predates the Giffords organization. Then we merged with them um, about six years ago and I've been the executive director of the Giffords Law Center, but I've been running sort of a policy focused think tank on gun violence prevention for 16 years. Um, and I've testified in front of the Senate and the Congress and done all kinds of work to try and educate people about the realities of gun violence in America and more importantly, the solutions. You know, for me, the best conversation we can possibly have as a country is about what the solutions are, what we know works, and how do we get from where we are right now to a place where we really can prevent these types of shootings. Well, amen to that, Robin. You know, I've been really interested in this issue and focused on it for some time now because I've covered so many of these shootings, school shootings, but also other shootings, but, you know, mass shootings, but starting with Columbine and, and then obviously Sandy Hook and many others as well. And Parkland, I, I worked on a documentary about Parkland. You and I were involved in a documentary uh, under the gun in 2016, which really laid out a lot of the issues. But one of the things we didn't talk about, which uh, I think we wanted to, but we just didn't have time, are assault weapons. And these military weapons, Robin, that I looked at a list of all these shootings, and these AR-15s have been used at virtually shootings. So um, there was an assault weapons ban that expired in 2004. And I'm right. wondering why, A, why it expired, and B, did it reduce the number of, of um, mass shootings or, or gut, the amount of gun violence when they were banned for that period of time? That's a great question. So what happened was after, it was actually after the, the um, shooting at 101 California Street in San Francisco in 1993, um, there was a big push to ban assault weapons. And Bill Clinton was in office 
um, and a federal assault weapon ban was passed in 1994. Now, one of the compromises that had to be made in order for it to pass was that a 10-year sunset provision was built into it. Now, I think at the time they wrote it, they assumed after 10 years, it would be renewed, that at that point it had been effective, um, that there'd be no reason not to continue it. But that was sort of part of the horse trading that went on to get that passed. Um, during the time of the federal assault weapon ban, 94 to 2004, assault um, murders, mass shootings reduced by 43%. And immediately after it sunsetted in the several years following it, mass shootings went up by almost 250%. So we have solid research proving that it worked. And Frankly, it wasn't a perfect piece of legislation. It had a lot of loopholes in it. So it allowed for lots of assault weapons to be grandfathered in. It didn't do well, much. You know, I tried to I tried to do some research, Robin. I've been obsessed with this story all weekend and just completely uh, beside myself, waking up in the middle of thinking of these poor children, waiting desperately for police to help them, thinking about the firepower of this particular weapon, which is just gruesome in terms of the velocity and the amount of damage you all it does to somebody's body. But this, I read this Ram Corporation study, Robin, and it said it was unclear if the assault weapons ban reduced the amount of gun violence and one of the things they pointed out is because there were so many still in circulation. And I know that in New Zealand, they not only banned assault weapons, and I realize it's a bigger country than ours, but didn't they then buy back all the uh, semi weapons so they weren't out there? Yes, and they also did the same thing in Australia where they had a big buyback after they um, began regulating assault weapons. And, you know, the other country that we point out a lot is um, what happened in Port Arthur in Australia, because that was a horrendous mass shooting in 1996, a actually a conservative government banned assault weapons, um, took a lot out of private hands and did other things to regulate guns. And there haven't been any mass shootings of the kind we saw here last week in Australia ever since. Um, and even if you weren't going to have, you know, some sort of buyback or confiscation, certainly at minimum, you know, registration and restriction on them, which we didn't have even in that period of 94 to 2004. You know, the other thing I'd say about the RAND study and a lot of the research is that, you know, gun violence tends to be such a multifaceted problem that even though we can say, hey, mass shootings went down during this period, I think it gives you evidence of its success as a policy but you know because doing that sort of hard research on being able to say definitively that's what caused the reduction is what a lot of you know really ethical hardcore researchers get stuck on because they say well yeah it went down but we can't prove it was because of this ban just because there's so many other factors at play so it's i i understand sort of the reticence to be absolute about it but i do think you know, we've looked at a lot of this correlation data. You and I talked about this years ago. You know, you look at states that have stricter gun regulations, that have things like assault weapon, you know, restrictions in place, that have fewer guns just generally in private hands, and they have significantly lower rates of gun death. And it, one of the things that has just been driving me crazy is that ridiculous argument about the good guy with the gun somehow being the solution. I mean, here's a situation where you had a whole lot of law enforcement standing around outside, but the lethality of the weapon in that building, the fact that, um, you know, nobody wants to really be that good guy, not even the guys apparently who are hired as their job. So this idea we're going to put more guns into more private hands, this ridiculous sort of NRA argument, um, only makes our children more at risk, only makes things less safe. You know, these regulations work. And the data shows that. I have no doubt about that. Well, let me ask you, you know, what is it for having really militarized weapons of war? Um, you know, no hunter worth his or her salt would use a semi-automatic weapon if you want to go hunting. I mean, what is the only argument that 
it, it infringes upon my second, uh, someone's Second Amendment rights. And if we don't have them, then then criminals will have them and will be outgunned. Because I was trying to understand the rationale for keeping these, um, you know, readily available without any kind of background check, any kind of registration, any kind of waiting period. What is it, Robin? What do people say? So, I mean, the real reason I believe is that the gun industry wants to sell more guns. And at some point they need more lethal weapons to sell because they're trying to persuade people that this is the gun you need in order to be at the cutting edge of the most, you know, scary, safe, whatever argument it is. And they've even started referring to them as like specialized sporting guns, which is insane because it's not something that true sportsmen and hunters would ever use. Now, why does the average person end up thinking they want one? The only two arguments I sort of tend to hear over and over, which makes my skin crawl. One is that they're really fun. I actually asked a gun owner friend this weekend why he owns an, an assault weapon. I asked him, why would you own this kind of gun? And he said, it's really fun to shoot it. Um, now, I, I, there's so many responses to that, but I do hear that argument very often. And then the other one is the one you mentioned, which is that, you know, I, it makes me feel stronger, safer to have a gun that is the most lethal weapon you can own. It's not a gun even to be used for self-defense. It's far, you know, too much firepower to be shooting off in your home. So, you know, you can't even shoot it at a lot of shooting ranges. My friend who I asked about this, this assault weapon he has, I said, well, is it fun to shoot it? He said, oh, I don't know. I haven't even used it yet because you can't even use it at a shooting range. So, you know, I, or maybe you can at some, I actually don't know how that works. But to me, there was this strange sense of like, it's like a toy. It's like someone who collects, I don't know, fancy watches, and they just want all the guns for themselves. They're proud to tell their friends, oh, I have this really scary gun. It's like, it's a, it, for me, you know, dealing with the rep repercussions, the ramifications of these guns, it's hard for me to reconcile um, that it's fun or that you need it for any, you know, real purpose. I think it's become something of an, of an acquisition. And for some people, it makes them feel, you know, powerful, stronger. Um, I turned off the comments just because they're a bit distracting, but if you all have questions, please submit them into the question section of this Instagram Live because there are a lot of misconceptions out there about gun violence. And one is, you know, the old uh, canard that it is a mental health issue. Now, I've been thinking about this a lot, Robin, and I know that we have refuted that because countries that also have mental health issues have a much, much, per capita, have a much lower rate of gun violence and it's access to guns. But could it be a combination of those things? Because of course we're reading, Robin, about an unprecedented mental health crisis in this country. And I'm curious if, if you've moved at all um, on, on kind of taking a, a, a multi-pronged approach to this issue. You know, it's it, what you said is really interesting. First of all, the United States does not have a bigger mental health problem than other countries. We don't have more violent video games than anyone else. You know, the things that people want to point to as the cause of the problem are not the real problem. Now, we do have a mental health crisis. You know, there are gun policies that would help us deal with that. So, for example, something like as simple as safe storage laws, something as useful and slightly more complex as red flag laws or risk protective order laws that enable us. Can you just explain red flag laws really quickly for me, Robin? Absolutely. So a red flag law, sometimes it's called an ERPO, ERPO, an extreme risk protective order. It's a law that allows us to temporarily remove guns from someone or prohibit them from buying guns when they're in a time of crisis. So somebody, it could be a family member, it could be law enforcement, it, in some states it could be a teacher, um, reports to law enforcement, and this is sworn under oath before a judge. This is not some, you know, game where people can, you know, hurt each other by taking away their guns. This is, a, you know, through the court of law. Um, and the court issues basically a protective order like you would with the domestic violence restraining order. And that allows law enforcement to remove someone's guns temporarily because there's evidence they present an imminent 
threat to themselves or others. It's actually very, very um, effective at preventing suicide because very often family members will know that someone's in a time of crisis and that they have guns. So it's a way to protect them from themselves. And it actually comes up a lot in these mass shootings. You know, my friend Mark Fullman recently wrote a book called Trigger Points about these behavioral risk assessments, like the signs we have of somebody entering a time of sort of severe crisis where they might do something like this. And in that instance, you could look at Isla Vista that happened in California. That's where these protective orders got a lot of traction. But if you look Look at Parkland. If you look at, you know, lots of these instances where there are mass shootings, there are signs. Family members or teachers or the school have evidence that somebody's in a time of crisis where they're making threats and they have guns. So these protective orders are useful. Yeah, you know, I think, but I'm thinking about this this terrible Valdi shooting where this 18 year old kid was estranged from his parents. Um, apparently had a terrible home life um, from everything I've read, um, had written threatening messages to women online, sort of thought it was part of the online culture. And I even think about Sandy Hook, where this kid's mother, if I recall, Robin, bought the gun for him. And yeah. I mean, I guess every little bit helps, but in many situations, red flag laws wouldn't necessarily um, prevent these horrible massacres of innocent people and children. The, and you're absolutely right, Katie. This, they're just one more tool that is available to try when we, in the instances where we do have signs, where we do have evidence, something, you know, I remember back when Parkland happened, how upset and outraged and angry everyone was because everyone understood what kind of threat this young man presented. In the, in the Isla Vista case, the facts were really just devastating because his parents informed law enforcement of the threats he was making. They went to his house, but they had no tool available to do anything with that information. And so these at least create a tool that can, in some instances, um, prevent these things. Now, there's lots of other policies. And you and I have talked about the fact that we have so many policies at our disposal to, to do this, right? There's lots of other countries that have a lot of guns in private hands. They do not have the kind of um, shootings and deaths that we do because they have robust, thoughtful, you know, intelligent, research-based policy making we could have we could raise the minimum age to buy weapons we could have universal background checks we could have safe storage laws child access prevention laws we could monitor dealers better you know most dealers are very good ethical business people but some are infusing the illegal market with guns we could regulate dealers better there's there's so we could properly fund atf to do their job and have a director i mean there's so many steps we could take i could name 50, but just starting with background checks, protective orders, um, safe storage laws could prevent certainly this type of shooting. And back to mental health, I mean, like we started with, we don't have a bigger mental health problem in this country than other countries have. But because we have so many guns, because there's such easy access to guns, I think it, if we do want to continue having so many guns in private hands, then we have a responsibility to be that much better than every other country in mental health. Because in our country, the same mental health problem they have in other countries leads to mass shootings not even that all of these mass shooters are mentally ill, because I think that that's a, an easy answer for what is a more complex problem. Um, but certainly we should be doing much, much better than we are in light of that. I just don't think that alone is ever gonna fix this problem without regulation. And I wanna talk to you about solutions in a minute because there does seem to be some movement on Capitol Hill. We're gonna get to that. Um, I just wanna just check on my questions. Uh, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to them in a minute because we talked about the assault weapons ban and perhaps a buyback program of some kind. We talked about raising the age to 21 when you can purchase a gun. We talked about red flag laws where someone who is a danger to himself or herself or themselves would be precluded from possessing a weapon. 
Um, we talked about, wait, there was one other thing that I, I'm now forgetting. Hold on two seconds. Um, I'll, I'll, it'll come to me. But I want to talk about the point of purchase stuff because this kid bought not one, but two AR-15s, semi-automatic weapons, um, and more than 4,000 rounds of ammunition. So he goes to a gun store in the state of Texas shortly after his 18th birthday. They just let him buy those guns, no questions asked. I mean, that to me is insane. But, and, and does it, and talk about what, how it varies from state to state in term, but, but does Texas, they just, anybody can just go in and buy two semi-automatic weapons and, and 4,000 rounds of ammo. What are they, magazines that fit into the weapon, right? Yeah, so sometimes it's, the, so you put the actual bullets into the magazine, um, but you, the rounds are the bullets themselves. And, you know, the thing is, we don't have restrictions on how many guns you can buy at once. We don't have restrictions on what type of guns you can buy. As long as the AR-15 is legal in Texas, anyone can go and buy one who is, who can, you know, if you go to a gun store, right, like this young man did, then you actually at least have to pass a background check. So at least if he did have a prohibition in his record under the federal law, if he, you know, had a conviction, if he had a domestic violence um, conviction, then he would have been prohibited. If he had very, very limited specific mental health prohibitions, he wouldn't have been allowed to buy that gun. But, you know, you can also go to a gun show in Texas. You don't even have to pass a background check. You go to a table that's being manned by a private seller who's not a federally licensed firearms dealer. We call them FFLs. And you don't even need to t have a background check. You actually could be someone who has a prior felony conviction. You could be somebody who has a domestic violence conviction. You could be someone who's been involuntarily committed. And you don't need to get a background check. It'll sometimes say on the front of these tables at gun shows, no background checks. So if you're someone who can't pass a background check, you just head straight for the table of the person who's a private seller. So you don't even have to do a background check. And same thing with online sales in a lot of states. Right. So online sales are the same way with no background check. But this is what frustrates me, Robin, because it, uh, what if he had never been convicted of a crime? What if he had never been institutionalized? What if there were no red flag? Sorry to get that confused with the other red flag. But what if there was nothing that said to the gun owner, uh, this kid is potentially dangerous is there a way that that there can be a better um sort of i don't know process to determine how dangerous somebody is or what they're going to be using the gun for or is that when a waiting period comes in or i mean couldn't there be a psychological i don't know i just don't know yeah, no. So, I mean, listen, there's California has a 10 day waiting period. It's actually there mostly for suicide, for suicide prevention, because it's such an impulsive act. So we do have a 10 day waiting period in California. You could also, you know, some states, if they don't have it already, I, I don't think it's like in that many states is one gun a month law. So in theory, California has a one gun a month law. You can buy it. It doesn't mean you can't still collect your mini arsenal at home, but you can only buy them one at a time. So that tends to actually be a policy that prevents trafficking. So it really reduces trafficking. States that have those kinds of restrictions have far less trafficking than states where you can buy an unlimited gun number of guns for obvious reasons. You know, you could just, you know, if you could have one gun a month laws, you could have raise the minimum age, you could have a restriction on assault weapons and large capacity ammunition magazines, waiting periods. I mean, these are all things that we have in California and we have much lower rates of gun violence. Unfortunately, the guns get trafficked. Um, from states with weak laws into states like California with strong laws. So there's only so much you can do with state law until we have federal law. But the biggest thing, Katie, would be background checks. Now, I know in this case, he would have passed a background check. And that's certainly the case for, for many unfortunate you know, tragedies is that the person hadn't actually 
committed any crimes or done anything like that until they did this terrible thing. Um, but you know, with background checks, it's a gatekeeper. So having universal background checks means if we implement a restriction, if we implement a minimum age restriction, or if we restrict how many guns you can buy, or we have a red flag law where we want to identify someone who's at risk, they can't go, you know, we, we say, okay, for 21 days, you can't buy a gun. You'll be flagged in the background check system until you go to a court and prove you're safe to have guns. Without universal background checks, none of those things are really enforceable in states where you don't have universal background checks because you can just go around the law. There is no system to uphold any laws until you have universal background checks. And I know it's not a policy that sounds that interesting, right? When we talk about, you know, um, assault weapon restrictions, it makes sense. It has like clarity to it. You know, don't have these weapons of war in civilian hands. Background checks kind of sounds like, oh, you fill out papers and you, but it actually is like the fundamental baseline for all gun policies to be enforceable. So, you know, it passed out of Congress. They passed the Bipartisan Background Checks Act of 2019. So that passed. I testified. They voted it through. They had Republicans on board. They won by a pretty large margin on that legislation. And the Senate hasn't even called it for a vote. So, you know, and I, I, it was really astounding. I testified in front of the Senate last March and I was so ready. I mean, I was ready to take on, you know, Ted Cruz and Josh Hawley and Tom Cotton and Lindsey Graham. They're all on Senate Judiciary. I was prepared to answer the hardest questions, the most difficult parts of this issue. And these are intelligent men who went to great schools or not it wouldn't be that hard for them to come after me with the hard stuff. And I was prepared to have a difficult conversation with them about the solutions to gun violence in America. And they asked me nothing, no questions. They didn't ask me a single hard question or any question about how to solve this problem. And it was infuriating because it didn't feel like they actually care about solving the problem. They don't actually want to know what the research says, what the solutions are. They do grandstanding and they go home and kids are getting killed and they're not even voting on legislation, basic legislation like background checks, which 75 percent of NRA members and gun owners agree with. That's the trick part, isn't it? And, you know, the one thing that I realized I forgot is the safe storage laws. And I read, Robin, that an average of eight children a day die from guns in the home that are not being properly stored. Um, is that, and I think that was a Brady, a Brady Foundation um, uh, statistic I read. Yeah, I mean, so I think it's something like 5 million children in America live in homes with loaded, unsecured weapons. Like 80% of school shootings happen with a gun that someone took from home, that's not their gun, it's someone in your friend or family that has a loaded unsecured weapon and they bring it to school and that's what these shootings are about. The other thing that happens is suicide. I mean, that's not sort of as relevant to Evaldi, although a lot of times mass shooters, domestic violence mass shootings are actually murder suicides. So there is a relevance to suicide sometimes built in. They call it also suicide by cop which is when someone literally goes out knowing that how it's going to end. Um, you know, th those safe storage laws could prevent so many of those shootings. It's not going to prevent all of them, but, you know, especially with suicide, which is a very impulsive act, not having a loaded weapon accessible is incredibly effective. And the same thing with these underage shooters, they can't easily get guns legally, but they can easily get them at home. And again, it's their brain formed your talk his brain isn't even fully developed and get having access yeah. to that kind of weapon is is crazy so you know Someone i think sorry that. i think they said they you know go ahead you there? did i lose you yeah no you didn't lose me there okay i'm here okay Someone was just mentioning in the question okay. that don't fully develop until you're 25 years old. So it makes sense to raise the age where you can buy a gun to 21. 
if you, you know, I mean, absolutely, is something easy. A lot of people, I think, feel so helpless and powerless and frustrated as I have since this shooting happened. Um, and then people kind of forget about it and go about their their day. A, do you think that something is going to change this time, Robin? Are you at all optimistic about it? I know that like there are some Republicans and Democratic senators who are getting together to try to come up with something. It seems to me that that something something has to get done on Capitol Hill. Is that your sense, or what are you hearing from people in who are you know who are been advocates like you for so long? I think there's definitely conversations happening. I think there's a lot of pressure right now. Um, you know, historically, their plan has been to wait it out. So to find a way to put, kick the can down the road until people get distracted by something else and the pressure is off and then they just don't do anything. Um, it's, it feels a little different this time, Katie. I, you know, I think the public is very outraged, as the, especially as more of the details of the shooting have emerged. I think, I mean, I, I am not sleeping much. We've discussed it. Like, it's just, it's really hard to wrap your head around this one. And I think it's really, it's not going away as quickly news-wise and in terms of the energy I'm feeling from people as usual. And I think that's a good thing when it comes to actually wanting to get something done in Washington, D.C. I think politicians, if they think this is gonna go away and they don't have to do anything, they're not going to. Um, they are talking right now, but I think it's really important that the pressure stays on for all of your viewers who are watching this, You know, pick up the phone call these Senate offices. It matters. It makes a difference. You know, don't be afraid to talk about this, to get out in the streets. Uh, ultimately, voting is the most important piece. But in the interim, I they pay attention. And if they think that they're going to get away with doing nothing, they'll do nothing. So they have to know people are watching and paying attention and are outraged, you know, especially people who live in the states of these Republican senators. I mean, most important thing of all, if you live in a state with a Republican senator, to call every day, call their offices, tell them that this is important to you, tell them it's a voting issue, tell them that you want to see them do something. You know, if they hear so, so much of that, it does move the needle for them. So it matters. I wanted to, I always thought it would be good to have a, a designated day where people who feel strongly about this issue call their congressmen and senators and you know raised hell for one day and just flooded the zone as steve bannon would say about this information flooded the zone with angry constituents then i thought well the nra will find out about that and then they'll do something but i just feel like there has to be something organized and then i thought about the march Parkland, Washington, D.C., with hundreds of thousands of people who showed up. And, you know, is there any kind of kind of unified effort? Because I feel like if, you know, 78 percent of NRA members, 93 percent support universal background checks, I think the last time I checked. So couldn't there be some kind of national movement that would get these motherfuckers to do something about it. NRA is already doing that, right? They're already lobbying and calling. That's why they have the power they do, because they get their members to make those calls, to show up in Washington. It's what, you know, Shannon Watts and the Moms Demand Action have been so good about. They, they have a grassroots, really powerful, active, consistent grassroots network that are showing up. They're showing up in Washington, D.C. They're showing up in their district offices. And, and you know, Giffords, Everytown, Brady, you know, we now have an actual movement with money on the other side. That's relatively new. That wasn't around 
10 years ago. So, you know, there is momentum building on the side of gun violence prevention. More people are, you know, putting money into it. More people are putting time into it. It is changing, but unfortunately it's slow. And in the meantime, kids are dying. And so, yes, there should be a national call in day. I have a feeling that's coming. I know there's a lot of events planned in Washington, D.C. next week. Next Friday is Wear Orange for Gun Violence Prevention and next weekend. Oh. Next feel like we need something better than that. I hate to say it. I mean, I wear orange on that day. I go, you know, I went to Washington when the park was for incredible money. I contribute to, I did a document. I mean, I just feel like there's got to be more. Yeah, I agree. And I think you know, it's, it's happening. I know it feels frustrating. You and I were both at that march. And, you know, I remember how powerful the documentary was, you know, these are steps. And, you know, I wish I could tell you what the tipping point is. I thought maybe Sandy Hook would be the tipping point. I thought maybe Parkland would be the tipping point. Maybe Uvalde is the tipping point. You know, I think that moment when, you know, like you and I, and so many people are fed up are truly fed up with this issue and, you know, tired of hearing the same old BS from Wayne LaPierre and the NRA, tired of hearing the same old BS from Ted Cruz and his cronies, you know, the same BS about the good guy with the gun and the BS about thoughts and prayers. I mean, it's infuriating when there's dead children to hear Ted Cruz, you know, when I hear him talking about the good guy with the gun and nothing could stop these shootings, you know, I want to just like scream because it's not true and people listen and they're misinformed and they become hopeless. I mean, one of the best things about your documentary about this conversation is people have to know that there are solutions. There actually is a way to do this. And you start with that premise. We can solve this problem. And that makes it a lot easier for people who maybe aren't political on this issue, who don't want to get involved. But if they just know that the person who represents them in the Senate can solve this problem if they choose to, then at least there's hope. And I think it motivates people to speak out. I mean, I hate to say it, Katie, there's like three things that motivate these politicians, right? There's money there's votes and there's their own like personal interest. And unless you can move one of those needles, unless they think that there are votes at stake with how they vote and what they do on this issue, unless they think there's money at stake, whether it's money going to their opponents' campaigns or money that's going to be removed from their campaigns because enough ethical corporations refuse to give them money, whether it's um, you know, them just realizing that their position on this no longer, you know, gets the traction that it once did. You know, I had hoped when the NRA had all those problems in the last couple of years. That, and then I'll let you go because you're so nice to do this. And everyone probably thinks I'm nuts doing this on a Monday night. I'm just so upset about this. And I, as I said, I can't sleep. But you know, um, I thought the NRA had been so badly damaged. They had so much corruption. A lot of the money, wasn't a lot of money, Wayne, Wayne LaPierre's suits and all this. I mean, they were misspending and, and uh, misappropriating funds. But but what happened? Did they reconstitute? Well, how, why are they powerful still? You know, they're still under investigation by the New York Attorney General, Tish James. So that hasn't concluded yet. It's still ongoing. Um, if you read the paper she originally filed against them, it you are exactly right. It is shocking, you know, super yachts and suits and private flights and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know, being misspent. The corruption and the bullying and the, the cronyism within the NRA doesn't surprise me. But I think a lot of people thought that they were better organization than that. So why do they still have power? I mean, their hardcore extremist supporters are still giving them money. So there's that. The gun industry, and this is what I think people don't realize, that the NRA is predominantly supported by the gun industry, not gun owners. That's why everything they support is about selling more guns because they represent the industry. They don't, you know, gun owners don't agree with them. So why do they take a position that's against the interests of their owner, of their members, because that's not really who they represent. 
Um, so they still have lots of money. And even though they're misspending so much, they have you know $200 million a year at least still coming in. So they have a lot of money. And you know what? For 50 years, they've been a very aggressive lobbying force in Washington. And it takes a while for politicians, I think, to catch up to realize the group that had been in power on this issue doesn't hold the same sway in the country. And I mean, I don't know if you saw the protests outside the NRA headquarters this last couple of days, but you know, I've never seen anything like that even after other terrible shootings. So I think the tide is turning against them. I'm not sure how on earth, I mean, Greg Abbott sitting and signing a law in Texas allowing for permitless carry, Wayne LaPierre sitting next to him. He's a lobbyist for God's sakes. Like it's so ridiculous. And, you know, I think, I think their time is coming and I think there's sort of the dominoes are falling, but the problem is as bad as they are, they're not going to be the last problem on this issue because there will be some other extremist gun rights group that will take their place if they fall. What we need is the American people, that 90% of people, some, you know, reasonably large portion of them to be fed up enough to do something, to call their senators, to vote differently, to scream and yell, to give money to their opposition. You know, they need to see that there are consequences, real consequences to their inaction or they're not gonna do it. And I think that's what the American public needs to activate around. There needs to be a, maybe this is the switch that flips people from apathy to action. And that's where the difference lies. Hey, I want to be just respectful of a couple of people. Well, I've gotten a lot of questions because I'm always impressed by a lot of smart people follow me. And I'm so grateful because I I want to help people understand these issues better. But tell, you know, how do you police safe storage? How does that work? And that is a good question. How do you do that? I mean, does somebody go into your house and check your guns and make sure that they're locked and, you know, and being kept safely? How does it work, Robin? Not really. I mean, that would sort of be, I think, too logistically difficult. You know, you have to make sure when people acquire guns that they get proper safes to store them in or trigger locks or combination, whatever the appropriate safe storage mechanism is you have to make sure everybody is required to purchase that with a gun so you just start by requiring people to have a capacity to store them safely which we don't in most states now secondly you know you pass a law which you know says you need to when you when you aren't using your guns they need to be stored safely when there's children in the home maybe you have even higher standards of how when and how they have to be stored safely and you make sure people when they buy guns are educated about that requirement and that responsibility you know educated about everything i mean you have to take a driver's test when you get a a license <laughs> take driver ed you have to learn these things and yet you can just go and buy a gun and have absolutely zero training. Not in every state. I mean, in California, you do need to get a safety certificate. There are states where you actually do need some training or at least sometimes written test or firing test. So there is requirement in some states. But like in a state like Texas, you don't need to get a background check. You don't need to get any training. You can carry a loaded concealed weapon in Texas without a permit, without knowing how to properly shoot a gun at all, knowing the rules of, of anything. So there's not even a requirement for a permit to carry a loaded concealed weapon, never mind just buy a gun. Um, and sort of back to safe storage, you know, it's funny, that question comes up a lot, but you think about something like you know, drunk driving. Now, given we do have random road tests, but that's actually not why people don't drunk drive. It's not because the cops are checking everybody. It's because if you get caught, there's like real consequences. And we've changed the culture in this country around drunk driving being unacceptable socially, about people actually having, you know, serious, severe consequences when they break that law. And people, I think, for the most part, drunk driving incidents have gone down dramatically. And I think a big piece of that is you change the culture, you change the ethos around what it means to be a responsible driver. It used to be no big deal to drive drunk. Nowadays, People don't do it. And certainly the younger generations are really, really serious about it. So, you know, I think it's less about enforcing it by going into people's home. It's more about creating a law that's intended to alert people to risks, to change their behaviors, to encourage it. And then when someone breaks the law, making there be serious consequences to that. We have a lot of walk, walk, 
I'm just curious, um, and, and I promise I'm going to let you go. I could talk about this for hours, <laughs> but why is arming teachers such a, an insane idea in your view? I mean, I feel like teachers have the hardest job and the most important job on the planet, and then to expect them to somehow, it's just insane to me. I agree. Um, first of all, just straight research shows that teachers having guns greatly increases the risk that children are going to be exposed to gun violence. So, you know, guns get, there's all of these ridiculous stories. Guns get left in bathrooms and loaded in drawers. I mean, you, the idea of having chaotic high schools or kindergartens with loaded guns around is to me ridiculous on its face. Not to mention people don't go into teaching so that they have to have guns and learn how to use guns. It, it, to me, it's almost antithetical. Um, so it's there's a weird ethos for me around the idea that we're asking teachers to, to handle this problem by being armed and taking the role of law enforcement. You know, when they poll teachers, teachers don't want that job. And on top of that, there's a risk. I mean, the, the chances of accidents and issues are just so much higher and it's, you know, I just don't think here you have law enforcement in this case of Rivaldi who had guns, they had training, they knew how to handle themselves under pressure, they knew the rules of engagement, and they were not able to really stop this kid. But you're asking a kindergarten teacher to do it, to me sounds like an unreasonable demand of that community, not to mention I don't believe it would be effective at stopping it. You know, we had armed guards at places like Columbine, it didn't actually prevent the shooting from happening. So I don't see how this is the solution. It, I also, I know that the investigation is going to continue, but this whole idea of 19 police officers, Robin, in that hallway, so many kids and adults calling 911. I mean, if that doesn't refute the best way to deal with a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. I don't know what does. I, like reading about that and these kids calling 911 and the parents just dust seeing the videos of them begging law enforcement to go in. I, 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 can, I can't even watch it because my heart just breaks for all of them that, you know, that maybe some of this could have been prevented. Um, you know, I, I know they're still releasing bits of information, but it sounds like that was a conscious choice not to go in because they were scared, you know, because they're not saying scared, but they were afraid of what they were going to encounter, that they weren't prepared for this. And they've allowed this person to remain in the school that long with vulnerable children. I, I, I cannot fathom it. And I agree with you. The idea that our, that we are somehow going to stop it with teachers with guns when law enforcement with guns can't stop it is, is beyond me. And I, you know, I know there's probably some teachers out there who, you know, are, are avid sports shooters and maybe we allow for the very occasional and unusual instance where a teacher who is form, former law enforcement, who's really well trained in some way to maybe get some sort of special permission, but you cannot ask untrained teachers, you know, one out of every four shots that a cop takes under pressure hits the target. So trained law enforcement who choose that job, who are trained to perform under pressure, are very inaccurate when they're shooting under difficult situations. So, you know, it's hard for me to imagine some of these guys are wearing body armor, they have AR-15s. It's just, there's no logic to the idea that an armed teacher is, is what the solution to that is. And I think looking at hardening schools, you know, increasing security, training police, when I read that Uvalde had a, a drill two months ago and went through all of this, in the list of instructions is if you're not willing to risk your life for an innocent person, then you should find a different line of work. Founded by the fact that it took the janitor like a half hour to find the key so they could breach the classroom. I mean, it just... But I, I, I'm trying not to focus on that because I think it's, 
it's horrific, but it's also a distraction from some of the things that really need to be done. And, um, but it just, honestly, it's, 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 it's sickening to read these accounts. And I, I think this is why I'm waking up in the middle of the night thinking of these poor children. Well, in closing, I know people have, see, isn't Robin incredible? She's so knowledgeable. She is so, so smart. She cares so deeply about this issue. And Robin, some people are asking if you have a public Instagram account so they can follow you. You, you are public, right? Not on Instagram, on Twitter, but not on Instagram. But maybe I'll create a public account because I know a lot of people prefer Instagram to Twitter. So um, I I'm Robin Thomas and I'm Robin Thomas GLC, I think is my Twitter handle. But why don't you do a public Instagram? Because I think you could continue to give people encouragement when they are prone to disengage because it is so maddening and so so sad honestly and maybe you could encourage people and tell us what to do um and how to keep the pressure on our public officials and how to join some of these groups like mom De mom's demand or <laughs> that you're doing giffords or every town or you know brady there's so many organizations that are doing great work and I think part of the frustration for people is this helplessness. Like, how do they channel their their outrage and anger and desire to see some kind of change in this country? And I think somebody like you could really, really be a great person to just kind of keep everybody engaged and keep them fighting the good fight. Well, I will definitely create a public Instagram and I will do that, Katie. And I would just say to people, stay outraged. Don't let it go. Don't become burnt out and complacent and, and give up. Don't give up. It requires us to have some staying power for this to change. And I think just if once a day you do one thing, don't just read the news, pick up the phone and call a senator. I know it sounds like a leap, but lots of these organizations, including moms, including Giffords, if you go to the websites, we can patch you through. Just don't be afraid to do something out in the world, whatever it is. I think if people stay outraged and stay active, that is the best chance we have of seeing change. So to, to channel that, emotion to channel that anger into doing something is all that I ask. And I think if we do that, there will be a change. Because people are saying they sometimes call and the switchboard is full or they can't get through. That's um, a good thing. If it's, if, it's, if it's busy, it means lots of people are calling. Wait a few hours and call again. Don't give up. This is what we want. We want to clog up the phone lines with people who care. What about if you live in a state like, what if I wanted to call Ted Cruz's office? Or what if I wanted to call somebody else's, uh, Lindsey Graham? I mean, me, but anybody. If you yeah. don't state, can you still call a senator who is Absolutely. A, who's being an obstructionist? Absolutely. It, they, they, it, may ca it may not have quite as much impact because they know there's not a vote attached to it but it does matter, right? So like they count those calls and they pay attention. And when they're flooded day after day after day after day, it does make a difference. Even if it's just other calls can't get through because so many people care and want to be heard on this, but, but make the call. It, there's, there's never a time that's not good to make the call. And maybe especially in a week or two as things, maybe people start to get distracted keep making the calls, put it on your to-do list. I call every single day. It's not the best part of my day, but I feel like at least I'm like putting it out there and it makes me feel like I'm doing something more. So and don't give up. Robin, if you have friends in some of these states, you know, email, do a, a email 10 friends who live in Texas or in other states <clears throat> and say, you know, tell them to call. Absolutely. I mean, I think especially if you know someone in one of these states with Republican senators, if you can get them to call that, 
is incredible or send them some information, try and get them if they're if they don't care about this issue or they're not on on the side of gun violence prevention, maybe just gently try and educate them. I know people think it's hard to change minds, but if you listen to what they have to say and you try and try to just be open to moving them a little, I think over time it could make a difference. I always talk about the success in the past about marriage equality and how when they started talking about love is love, people really connected to the message. And I think on this issue, you know, talking about the safety of our children, protecting our communities, yes, it's about guns, but we all care about the same thing. Everyone, whether they're in favor of guns or not, all we all want is our children to be safe and our families and communities to be safe. And if we start from that premise that we all just want to be safe and happy, then maybe we can take step one and say, you know, background checks would help all of us be safer. And it would still allow law abiding people who aren't prohibited from having guns to get them. So I think we have to be willing to sort of repeat that conversation and stay put in that. We all want to be safe. How do we get there? Because we're not there right now. Well, Robin, I told you we would talk for like 15 or 20 minutes. We've talked for about an hour. Thank you, everybody, for um, for joining us tonight. I'm going to try to save this. I've been having trouble doing that with Instagram. But, Robin, I just I, I, I admire you so much. And I just think the world of you. And you're the first person I always call when something happens so you can help me understand these issues. So, so thank you. And, and we're lucky to have an advocate like you out there. Thank you, Katie. And thank you for keeping attention on this issue. I know a lot of people care about and respect um, your thoughtfulness and your desire to have more information. So I really appreciate that you continue to put it out there. Well, I'm going to keep going and just do my best. Robin, and thanks everybody for watching it. Excuse my bad language earlier. I apologize. That's very uncharacteristic, at least when I'm live on Instagram. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Robin. Bye, Have Katie. Have a good night, everyone.